From Luke chapter 23, I wanted to let you know where we're going. Down in verse 20, the doctor writes, Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. Excuse me. Yeah, that's right, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. We will get there in a minute, but first, let me set some context for you. I bring you greetings from rainy Southern California and um, flew in yesterday, told several it was a little bit more of an adventure than it usually is to fly across the country. Have you been to the grocery store? Can't imagine that on steroids. In the airport and also on the airplane, people are wondering. Some people are white-knuckling their grocery carts. And for me, it creates a setting of adventure, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the town I hail from is quite different than Edmond. Um, it's halfway between Los Angeles and San Diego, a little town called San Clemente, surf town in which every day a surf report and the size of the waves and et cetera are posted, Easy, easily looked up anywhere on Surfline, and our local D1 high school is usually the national winners of the surf championship. It permeates our culture, which is good news and sometimes bad news. It's a very laissez-faire attitude in a beach community, but I love it. It's home. I grew up in Northern California and moved south 20 years ago, which if you do not know, are like two different states. Northern Californians look down their nose at Southern Californians. They think they are the superior race, and I know that because I was one. <laughs> but now, I'll never go back. With that said, I also love the land of Israel. And I suppose in most of my years raising children, um, I have four mostly grown children, and they span from California to North Carolina. And I suppose I never thought I would get there. My husband was deathly afraid of me traveling there, let alone leading a tour. But when the youngest graduated, he said, all right, you might as well go. And I did. And then I went back. And the second time I went back, it, Her Eric and I met on a trip sp sponsored by Christians United for Israel. And it was during that time that they also said, we would like you to commit to leading a group back, Lord willing. Well, the Lord was willing, and so last year took two groups back, one in February and one in November, and took quite a few, not quite a few, a good few of folks from here, so I wanted to direct your um, attention to the screens. This was set in Capernaum, which was the home of Jesus' headquarters in the north shore of the Galilee. And while this uh, synagogue was not there when Jesus taught, there are relics all over that, that span of property there that were there and from the synagogue in which Jesus would have taught. Peter's home has been excavated where he healed his mother-in-law. And it's a setting that as you look around, it's another place that supports the archaeological evidence that supports the truths of our scripture. I wanted to tell you that what you believe is not just something that was handed down to you, it is defensible. And you should know how to defend it using truths from science, history, archaeology, and so on. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So this was Capernaum. The next picture is my good brother Keith. And this was on the boat. This is Keith Montgomery. Um, unfortunately, I had sent ahead a video clip, and you can see somebody behind taking his picture as well. It was a trip. This was basically the conga line, okay? And I know we're in church, but we started with Hava Nagila, and then we went to worship music, and this, again, was set on the Sea of Galilee. Some days, the Sea of Galilee is like a bathtub, 
but when she gets rough, a squall can come up out of nowhere, and all of a sudden you say, okay, now I know why the disciples were afraid. Three times I saw it, just like this, and when it gets rough, you think, oh, I think I'd like to get off of this boat. And of course, this boat's probably five times the size of the boat they were on. But um, that was in November. And the next one, please. So this was in the Church of St. Anne's, and it is right off the Via Dolorosa. You come off the Temple Mount through the Lion's Gate and onto this magnificent property. You, in the old city, um, which if you've seen pictures of it, it is much like shopping in an old bazaar at points, and there's traffic and people, you know, horns honking, and there you see the military, the IDF, and the machine guns swinging and so on. And then we entered into this little church. And when we, we weren't the only one. Groups line up waiting to get into this place where the acoustics, when you worship God, it just literally... Um, you, you swear you can hear angels as well. Absolutely beautiful. So here's Harry leading us, and then the young man standing next to me, 20 years old, came from my beach town, and he's a body boarder by trade, and he came to find out if Jesus was real. He did not come, at, come because he was convinced. He came to find out if there was merit to what he had been told and what he had heard, and so he did, and so he put his weight on that. I think there might be one more. Wait, let me look at my notes. That's, that's fine. That's perfect. That leads us. So this is one of the things I want to tell you, if you did not already know, is that when you get to Jerusalem, especially the old city, the Temple Mount, the wall, and the proximity to the Mount of Olives, I swear on a good day with the wind behind me, I could throw a ball from the old city to the Mount of Olives. Most often when you see a picture of the Mount of Olives, it's taken from the Mount of Olives, looking back at the old city, and you see that familiar gold dome. Unfortunately, everybody, you pretty much when you go there, you orient yourself by where's that gold dome. Well, that gold dome, of course, is Muslim property, and, and indeed, the Mus Arab Muslims control the Temple Mount. But to me, this is the picture. This is the picture, essentially, standing in front of those walls, looking back at the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is the mount from which Jesus ascended into heaven. But it is also, if you were to look at that, the copse of trees in the foreground is in the Kidron Valley. So we're going to talk about it when Jesus and Eric talked about it last week. And if you didn't listen to his message, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to it because he even shows you the steps, the ancient steps, which Jesus would have traversed three times that night, the night that he was tried. So I'll take you to that passage in a moment, but I want to give you the context for where we're going. So the cups of trees in the foreground would be as you walk across the Kidron Valley. And then you can see on the right-hand side uh, what appears to be a cement path on the way down, that is about where the path for Palm Sunday when they came into the city. And on that day, they were saying, Hail, King Jesus. And not even one week later, they were saying, Crucify him, as we just heard. Now, to the middle of there, you can see another copse of trees. There's a church there. But down to the lower left is where the Garden of Gethsemane was and is. At that time, probably much more like a, an orchard of olive, of olive trees, but nonetheless, it was a place where Jesus often retreated with his disciples to pray, to get alone. Do you have a place? Do you have a place where you go and you get alone? Let me take you there now. Oops, next one, Garden of Gethsemane. You can see in this picture, which again, when Jesus was there, they wouldn't have the nice little carved pathways. But when Jesus was there, there would have been flowers like these, because we remember it was during Passover time, which is in the spring of the year. So it wasn't all the way, like when we went from here, it was November, so the foliage was tired. There was a lot that you just didn't see at that time of year. But notice the gnarled branches, the gnarled trunk, 
of the olive trees. We don't expect that any of the ones that you literally view and, yes, can touch, that they were there. See the, see the, the wildflowers there? Now, there, this particular tree, they have a, a border around and protect it a little bit, but in general, you don't think that you're looking at 2,000-year-old olive trees, though it would have been something like this, where Jesus knelt and prayed, and sometimes, and it's true, Eric mentioned it last week, that I had one growing, growing up in my house. It was a picture that was mostly bluish in tones, and it had a full moon, and Jesus was kneeling, and it looks really serene. Well, we know that's not really what happened that night, because while he started that way, he then agonized that if there be any other way, that God would make it. And yet, and yet, he, he held the course that he was called to make. And so he suffered, but it was the beginning of the worst of the suffering that night. As you know, when he stood up, he would be betrayed. So even before he, I don't, I'm not positive that Jesus closed his prayers to his father with amen, so be it. But even before he stood, he would have heard the clanging of the armor of the Roman soldiers coming, right? There would have been a huge attachment coming. So imagine in the, in the still of the night, and it's late that night, they've had the Passover meal, what, what we now call the Last Supper. He's told them, one of you is going to betray me. He's taken off. He's given us exactly what we need right now as a picture for service. Some of us right now need to think, who can I serve? Who is my neighbor that's just gotten over pneumonia who maybe needs groceries brought, in, brought to them? So he gives us, even that night, an example for us to follow. And then, as you know, he will be drug off and tried. But today, in just a few minutes I have with you, I want to show you what he willingly subjected himself on the way to the cross. See, it would be easy to picture that he went, even if he knew little about the story, that he went from that serene picture kneeling with the, you know, in some pictures of Catholic ones, they have the halo over him, looks really serene, to the cross. No, there was a lot that went on. In fact, there were effectively six trials, illegal, but they had them. I want to sink the people and the places in the biblical account, the ones that we read in the Gospels, into some of the archaeological evidences for those. And then I want to help you see yourself in the story and how it relates to us today. You know what? Maybe like no other time in history. So, trial number four, we'll start with Pontius Pilate. Just who was this man? Well, depends on who's writing. Most of what we know about Pilate was recorded by either Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian from the first century, or Gaius Tacitus, the Roman historian. Once again, I want you to think about some of your young people and some of you perhaps who are sitting here who are at university and you only have to have one class and a professor tells you that old Bible that you read you really think that's true? Do you know how that's been handed down, how it's been watered down, how it's been changed? And just like that, they chew our kids up and spit them out, and we don't have a response. As my dad used to say, you sit there with your tongue in your mouth, and you don't say anything. And that's because we, they, find, they render us defenseless with just a couple few chosen sentences. It should not be. So Pilate, who was he? Well, he was, at this time, he was brought by the Romans in to keep peace during Passover for fervor because throngs of people would have come into Jerusalem and it would have been teeming with people. Some people remember him as somebody who hated the Jews, Other, others as just somebody who was called to keep a bunch of unruly people together who had no respect for him. But the man would ordinarily be found in a place called Caesarea Maritima where he had a palace. The footprint of which we can see here, this is a magnificent property that set, is set on the Mediterranean Sea. It's a harbor built by Herod the Great. And when you see what's unearthed there alone, you can imagine and you try to think in the first century, and actually some of this was built before the first century, how in the world did they move these boulders into place? And then when you see the columns that are there, you can't even imagine because we're so sophisticated, of course, in 2020, how these 
unsophisticated, I'll just leave it that way, first century folks could build such a thing. When you see the amphitheater, which is still used today for concerts, when you see the hippodrome where there were races, etc. And so this is where Pilate normally would have been. This is what made him happy. And it took me three times to go to Caesarea Maritima before I locked onto something that meant something, really meant something to me besides how pretty it was. And that was this. Prior to... Um, Prior to the convert that happens in Acts 10 and 11, which, by the way, is a great script for a play or a drama or a movie, uh, there had been no Gentile believers. You see, we forget because we're Christians in 2020, but Jesus came first to the Jews, so Christianity went out to the Jewish people first. And it wasn't until a Roman centurion, that is, he was a, a guard over 100 people, accepted Christ, and he lived in Caesarea Maritima at this very place. So then I thought, of course this is why we came here. Paul was probably in prison right there in Caesarea Maritima. But in 1961, a stone like this one, this is a replica because the original is in the uh, museum there in Jerusalem, this um, was unearthed, and it's called the Pilate Stone. First of all, I want to tell you that I subscribe to Biblical Archaeological Review, Archaeology is literally being unturned by the weak over there. And what it's doing, every time it's dug out of the earth, more of Scripture and the places that are listed in Scripture as well as the people. There have been coins found there with Pilate's name. But prior to 1961, except for those historians, the only place we heard about Pilate, the only place we cared about Pilate was that he tried Jesus. You see, so once that came out, it, it shored up, oh, I guess there really was such a guy. So what that did is it served to shut up scoffers. So let's keep going. That is who Pilate was. That sets um, the scene for him. But now, on this night, I'm going to take you back to that night. It had been a long night. And once again, we can easily fault those disciples for falling asleep, can't we? Jesus said, could you stay awake and watch for me, with me for a while? Remember when he said that? Right there in the garden, the one with the moon and the one with the halo over Jesus in the picture, and they fall asleep, and we think, I never would have done that. I would have watched and waited. Oh, really? If you were at the Passover meal and have four cups of wine, maybe you would have fallen asleep too. So they had eaten the Passover meal. They've gone down, out across the valley. They're in that garden. Jesus is arrested kissed, betrayed. Have you ever thought about when we take communion that we say on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread? Do we underplay the pain, the emotional pain Jesus was caused since he was betrayed by one of his closest friends? And he even warned him that night, didn't he? And he did it anyway. So it's on this night they have now dragged him back to Pilate. Back after three trials, three religious trials, one in front of Caiaphas, one in front of Annas, his father-in-law, and then another by the Sanhedrin, the 71 members of what we would consider sort of like our Supreme Court. But you know what's interesting, and you don't read about it too much, you know who was there that day sitting on that Supreme Court, that Sanhedrin? The same man, the same religious leader who came by the dark of night in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, the same guy who found Jesus so credible that he took the risk of being shamed, dishonored, etc., and he came at night to say, I want to know more about you. And after Jesus told him he had to be born again, he pressed in at the risk of looking stupid, right? And all of this, the beloved disciple records for us. So on this night, this night, Nicodemus, who knew this was illegal, stood right there, with his teeth in his mouth, stood right there, quiet, while the Sanhedrin said, get him out of here and take him to Pilate. And so off they went. They go to Pilate. I'd like to take you now to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. I know that we're a society that now reads our, phone, our Bible on our phone. I know that we go to church, and I know the Bible is on the screen. But I want to empower you to buy a new Bible or get your old one out and carry it, write in it, date it, what you thought at that time. If you are a parent, 
My very favorite thing I have of my mother's, my mother had me when she was 45, so I was born to an old mom. She had me at 45, and the most favorite thing I have of hers is their Thompson King James reference Bible with her hand penmanship. Because, of course, the King James Version was the Bible that Jesus read, she always told me. Didn't matter to her that it was in English and Jesus didn't, yeah, it doesn't matter, okay. Use your Bibles. John chapter 18, please. Verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters. It's just so interesting. You talk about straining a gnat and swallowing a fly. They wouldn't go in, and yet they had broken their own laws by trying him in the middle of the night without witnesses, etc. So all they're worried about is that they're going to be able to have the Passover meal. They wouldn't go in. So they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went out outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Thereby, immediately, no, he said, judge him. They answered, it's not lawful us to put, for us to put anyone to death. They revealed their motives immediately. Verse 32, this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Verse 33, so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Remember, Rome had to find him guilty of sedition to Caesar. Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. My servants Yes, that's right. But my kingdom is not from the world. Verse 37, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Did you hear that? If you really care about truth, Jesus said it here. This is before I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? When Pilate heard him say this, he said, I find no guilt in him. Went out to the Jews and told them. Flipping back now to Luke chapter 23. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. When he had heard that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. We're now on the precipice of the fifth trial, the third, excuse me, three religious and the second civic trials. Our Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to get the scene of this, is brought before Herod Antipas, He's the son of Herod the Great. He's also in town to watch over the Jews to make sure that they do not get out of control on Passover. He's residing in the ancient Jerusalem castle of his family, probably on the edge of the temple, just opposite the grounds. Herod Antipas, being his son, was just about as vile as his father had been. While he had built the capital city of Tiberias, which I love, on the Sea of Galilee, which if you take a trip there, you usually spend three nights there and do the journeys that involve Jesus' teaching, and you sail on the Sea of Galilee right out of Tiberias. The buildings are magnificent. But though he built that, he tore his own life down with a moral living. And if there's one scene, there's actually two scenes that I think are so apt in the Passion of the Christ, um, and Gibson does a masterful job creating a creature like Herod, debauched, lascivious, drunken, in white and gold. And on this morning, Herod gets to rule about Jesus. 
We think the world's turned upside down right now. What in the world? And yet, he welcomed the, the interruption himself, Caius, Anaphis, and the Sanhedrin, because he'd been curious about Jesus. Everybody was at least curious about Jesus. And he's hoping maybe on this day he'd get him to do a little magic in front of him. Luke's gospel records, going back to Luke chapter 23, if you have your Bible, in verse 8. I don't hear any pages turning, so I'll turn mine. Okay, so Luke chapter 23, verse 8. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. Verse 9, so he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. So let's stop here for a second. This is so tragic when you think about it, that this man could stand and mock our Lord. He who knew no sin, and now think about this, even the, the contemporaries of Jesus who didn't really know about his sin condition or not, he taught like no one they'd ever heard. He broke the social mores for women by talking to women, by proclaiming the adulterous woman set free of her sins and forgiven by talking to the woman of the well, by healing people, by loving children, by taking them onto his lap. He said, let the children come unto me. So how could this fool, this Herod, have the right to rule over our Jesus, to make any statement, let alone to mock him? And scripture goes on to say, not only does he mock him, but they put royal robes on him, and they jeer at him. Ultimately, Herod finds no guilt and sends him back to Pilate. I wonder if he remembered when Jesus stood before him and said not a word in his own defense. Did it ring in his ears? A prophet must perish only in Jerusalem. Did he remember Jesus had said that? And how about 700 years earlier? He would have heard the words of the prophets that Jesus would stand before his accusers, dumb, that is to say, not speaking a word. So he's dragged back again for trial number six to Pilate. This is back in Luke chapter 23, and in verse 13 it says this, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. Wait a minute. Punish him? He didn't just mock him. Now this, this pilot is going to punish him? How can this be? But the whole crowd, upon the word that they would release him, shouted, away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection and for murder. They wanted him instead of just call him the good rabbi. But how about healer? How about friend? How about best friend to 12 who bunked next to him for three plus years? For the third time he spoke to them. Why? Why crucify him? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and released. He said it again. Somewhere in there, history tells us her name was Claudia. Matthew 27 records her as the wife of Pilate. Had come to him and said, don't have anything to do with this man. I've had a horrific nightmare about what's going to happen with this. Wash your hands of him. Get away from him. And so he says it again. I will punish him and release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. But allow me to back up into this passage for just a minute, because even the punishment, let's think about this. He said he would punish him. The level of the punishment had to be such that it would mollify this crowd, 
You see, this crowd was out for Jesus to die because they had been whipped in, just like our media is whipping our culture, our country, I say, into a frenzy. Do you agree with me? And, and we, like fools, are turning on our television and we're watching 24-7, scaring our own self. I mean, this is, these are games we played as a child where we would scare ourselves and go, like, why would we watch that and get scared? But it was sort of, and we're doing it as adults. And I look out here and I think to myself, parents, you have children who are looking at you. You're, they're drafting off of you. What are they hearing you play? What are they hearing you say? Grandparents, what are your grandchildren hearing you? Tap our helmets right now. We serve the King of Kings. And we're going to come back to that. But, but I, I, want to, I just want to tell you that right here, even now, this crowd had been so incensed, so lathered up. And by whom? By the religious leaders. Okay, this, is, this weren't the Romans. It was the religious people that were after Jesus because he posed a threat to them. So he had to whip them, him in such a way that they would be satisfied, okay, we won't crucify him, right? That's what he's looking for. So a Roman soldier, Jesus would have been leaned over, tied with his hands, again, having zero, zero control, stretched out so his back would have been taut. And I'm sure... I've never thought of Jesus having any weight on him. I'm sure he was not a heavy man. He had no flesh that, to absorb anything like that. And 39 times, now I want to remind you that the whip was not the kind that we used to get in Tijuana, like a bull whip. With one, it would have had multiple thongs of leather with glass, stones, bones, etc. And remember, that Roman soldier's life was probably in danger if he wimped out. So that Roman soldier gave it all he had. And again, going back to Gibson, when Mel Gibson made The Passion, I remember one of the criticisms of him was that he was too gory depicting this scene. But if you did your research, and one of the fellows whose research I read was Lee Strobel, and he said, oh no, he actually underplayed it because the way that, the, that whip would have been constructed, often the person bled out right there. But if they didn't bleed out, many times some of their organs were open. So the back was open to see the organs. So Jesus suffered mightily before he went to the cross. So we'd had these six trials and now this flogging and all while these people stood by, and I wonder, I wonder, I, I think, you know, for, for 2,000 years, we've all kind of went, well, I wasn't there. But I'm wondering, why didn't anybody speak up? I mean, some of those people were dead to rights until Jesus healed them. So where was Zacchaeus, outcast of the society, who had just recently literally been set free from his thieving ways by Jesus in Jericho. Where was he? Why did he speak up? Where, where, where was the woman at the well? Where was blind Bartimaeus who was no longer blind? Where were, how about, well, we know that Peter had already turned tail because he denied him three times, but what about the other 10? We know that John was standing nearby. John never left the foot of the cross. It does, does it not surprise you that John did not? Remember, John called himself, I am the disciple who Jesus loved. He, to, he told all of us for, for ad infinitum that Jesus, I was Jesus' favorite. So as Jesus' favorite, how could he stand there? How could he stand there and not say, do you know this man? Do you know how he's changed our lives? Remember, Jesus is going to set them free from the law that has bound them, 613 points of law. So they all sat there. And yet, you know, I, I look at it and I go, okay, so all these years I was born a Christian. I know, that's not, I know that's not good theology, but you know what I'm saying. I never knew not being. And all these years I felt just quite fine because I wasn't there that day. But here's my question. You couldn't speak up then, but do you now? When you have a chance to say, oh no, you don't need to be afraid, because God's got this. Do you ever say, when your young person says, mom, 
you know, coach so-and-so did this and he benched me and whatever, do you give your child a word of encouragement or say, we can take that to Jesus because there's nothing you're going to go through that he doesn't care about. Um, People are looking, and we have the greatest opportunity ever. You know, um, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he had said, go to Jerusalem and wait. Remember? Ten more days, and then the the Holy Spirit came. But he had said to them in Acts 1-8, when the Spirit comes, he will give you power to be my witnesses. A witness only tells what they've experienced. Have you ever experienced the peace of God? Do you know that the most Googled verse, the most popular verse on you version in the Bible app is not John 3.16, even though it's on your in and out cup? It's Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. And the peace of God, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds and keep them quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Do you know how many people you know who need that peace? I'm sorry, I did the same thing first service, but I have no idea what time my time's over. So can somebody tell me how much longer I have? Three minutes? Five minutes? I'm I'm good? Okay, all right, thank you. Sorry, I'm a rookie here. Um... Okay, I want to tell you a story. Um, I'll back it up to the year 2000, because it'll give you everything you need to know about why I am, who I am, and what have you. My youngest, who was two, we had just moved to San Clemente, had kidney failure, and we almost lost him. And at the time, my kids ranged, you know, two, five, 15, and 17. And we almost lost him. In the story, and I can, I can cite and I can give you all the details and the numbers from the creatinine to the BUN and anything if you want to know about kidneys and, and nephrology. But the important part was that for whatever reason, except prayer, God healed him. He's 21. He's on his way home from Boston right now because his school was closed. But I remember telling God, I don't know why you healed Danny, but I will tell whoever, whoever I get the chance. I'll share your love. Remember, I'd been a Christian before that, but it was like, okay, now he turned up the pilot light. I'll share your love. I'll go. Give me the chance. I'll go. And so for me, I suppose my greatest adventure, and you can read my bio, something on there, and you can look me up at pastorwoman.com. I used to do street ministry in Long Beach. That's what they called me on the street, the Bloods and the Crips. They called me Pastor Woman. So when it's time to pull up some uh, 501c3 to support my ministry. That's what I named it, Pastor Woman. So my greatest adventure is to take normal conversations and turn them into ones that involve faith. So yesterday I'm on the way here, and um, I flew from San Diego to Phoenix and Phoenix to here. And it was kind of interesting. You know, first of all, I prayed in the morning. I challenge you to do this. Ask God to give you an opportunity to encourage someone. Ask him to give you an opportunity to share him with someone. It is the greatest adventure ever. You see, people sometimes think, well, if I become a Christian, then I'll have to check my brain at the door, and I'll be bored, and I'll be and I'll, whatever. Not, not so. Nothing could be further from the truth. You've bought a lie if that's what you believe. So anyway, this fellow and I were the last two to board. We're watching the end of President Trump's speech, and he was clearly not concerned, nor was I. And, um, it, but you could see white knuckling, just like in the grocery store, people concerned, etc. So we get ready to get on the plane, and uh, he said, this doesn't scare me, something of that. And I said, me either, you know why? Because I trust God. Okay, see, that was my feeder, right? So you throw out the gauntlet, and you see if they pick, take the bait and what have you. So he, I said, I trust God. And he asked me something more about that. We got on the plane, the plane was virtually empty. So we wound up Well, it was an accident. I got up and moved by him. That's the truth. I got up and moved by him, and there was one seat in the middle, and we began to talk about life. And I said, how about you? Are you a man of faith? By the way, it's a very safe question. Are you a man of faith? Because they're going to say no, or they're going to tell you why, or they're going to tell you what faith. And it creates a meaningful conversation instead of fluff. So he, he said, well, I used to be. And he began to tell me. I said, what happened? 
And he looked around, and then I said, you know what? Not only can no one hear you, but we're never going to see each other again, so just level with me. And he said, I, made, I sinned bad, and I just went downhill. And I, uh, I'm going to tell you a couple of the circumstances, because they could happen to any of us. It started with a little compromise, you know, a little bit of this. He was, he was a mar career Marine, and he was the bodyguard of Junior Seau. If you know who Junior Seau is, raise your hand. Or nod your head, that works too. So he was there, and he told the lies. He covered for Seau, right? Seau with his gambling, his womanizing, his drugs, etc. We were all told it was just the brain injury, right? He said, I know better than that. I was his main man. So he tells me that. Then he tells me a story. Let me tell you, sh show you how only God could orchestrate this. He said, I've carried that all these years. I, he, he goes, and at that time, I had an affair. I lost my marriage. And he's, and he, and he, and he's real, he's real. I said, you're never going to tell, we'll never see each other again. Let her rip. And I began to give him the scripture, 1 John 1, 9. My Bible was in my suitcase. I had it memorized. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he goes, could you keep writing? Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, he's removed our sins and on. And I just was writing him. Anyway, um, so then he told me another story, and this is the one that was the real clincher for him, and only God could have orchestrated this. He said, yeah, so did you live in San Clemente in 2012? I said, yes, yes, I did. He goes, well, I was a Marine. I don't know what his position was. I was a commander there, and on a given morning, I had a soldier show, show up late. He said, and, it, and this is key to the story. He said he was a he was black man. This guy was not, he, but he indicated this, and I said, Okay, and he said, I ripped him, and he told me I cussed him out, I whatever, whatever, because he showed up late. He showed up late because he had been walking around your high school. He said, you know where San Clemente High School is? I live right above the high school. I also led Fellowship of Christian Athletes at San Clemente High School so for four years. And my sons played D1 uh, soccer and whatever there. Yes, I knew where the high school was. Do you remember in 2012 when that Marine was shot? I said, I do. He said, it was my fault. So what do you mean? He said, I yelled at him and said, we're having a meeting tomorrow morning at whatever, 0, 600, whatever the time is. You don't be one minute late, not a minute late. Okay, sir. So the man got up, remember he's black, got up at 4.30 in the morning, has his two daughters in the car to go and walk the high school perimeter and pray over the high school. He has to be there at 4.30 this morning so he's not late to his meeting with the sergeant, right? And what happened was the, the driver, the, the uh, Marine, pulled up, and he knew from experience they didn't lock the gate. I know from experience because that's San Clemente High School. So he just drove up in his blazer, bumped it, and kept going. Well, from somebody, a cop across the street, it looks like he just broke through the gate, right? So the cop pulls up, and he sees two little girls. It's dark, right? It's dark, and here's this man in, you know, what is going on here? And he's got two little girls in the back seat. He sees mayhem. So he says, you know, calls the guy out. The guy opens his door, reaches for his ID. Cop riddles, with, riddles him with seven bullets. My airplane friend said to me, it was my fault. If I, had not, if I had not ordered that, if I had not said that, he wouldn't have gone at 4.30 in the morning. It wouldn't have been dark with his two little girls in the back. That, that young widow and on and on, Here's what I want to say to you. That was a divinely orchestrated meeting on an airport that some silly blonde from California was riding next to this guy who was on his way back to the Pentagon. It was so divine that he was willing to just open up because what did he have to lose? And I said, could I pray for you right now? And I prayed that God would help him forgive you know, and I said, do you understand what has happened here? Because remember, I had nothing to lose, so I just shoot straight from the hip. And I said to him, do you understand what's happened here? I said, because you have felt guilty for your sin, I said, you see, under, you know, on one playing field, that would seem righteous, right? We are, we are so, so overcome by what we've done in the past that we take to ourselves. He's so isolated himself. He took this position in the Pentagon. He doesn't go anywhere not even to the gym. He said, I have no friends. I've entirely isolated myself, and I've isolated myself from my family because of my shame. 
I said, do you understand what's happened to self, yourself? You've become so self-centered, you've rendered yourself absolutely ineffective. And he said, I never thought about, that way, about it that way. You see, it seemed okay to just isolate yourself. But the fact is, the man was, he was, he had, was a shell of himself. And I said, do you understand how much you have to give? And there's a reason God had you be there with Junior Seau. Do you know how you could speak to young people about fame and how deceitful it is and how fleeting it is? And so I talked to him about his purpose. I literally drew him a whole diagram about how God could use this and this and this. I said, get back in the game. What are you waiting for? I said, hey, by the way, is your wife remarried? No. I said, go after her. He goes, listen to this. He goes, you can't make this up. He goes, besides that, we just had our first grandbaby this week, and my wife and I were sitting side by side for the first time yesterday looking at this grandbaby, and we were laughing together. I said, go after her. You remember the God that you told me that you served? Because he told me he was a youth pastor when he started cheating, and he was so ashamed for his hypocritical ways. What does that have to do with you? There are people that you're going to encounter just by saying, even to the checker at your, at your, my son's a checker, and yesterday two guys got in a fist fight and one knocked the other one out. My son's my size. And one knocked the other one out in his check stand. People have lost their minds, but we haven't, right? What did God say? He's given us a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. Just by a smile on your face, by being willing to serve. And I'm going to close with this because I'm sure I'm way over my time now. Um, Psalm 40. Before I prayed this morning, I confess, I looked at my Instagram feed. And my Instagram feed includes Tony Evans. And he was talking about Psalm 40. Psalm 40 verse 4 says this, Blessed is the man. And I want to say blessed is the athlete. Blessed is the young woman. Blessed is the old woman who makes the Lord his trust. In verse 16, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. You see, the coronavirus did not catch God off guard. He didn't wake up and go, oh no, oh no, now they're sick in America. Oh no, now they've closed their schools in Israel. This is a chance to turn to him, and this is also a chance. I want to say thank you to Eric, your pastor, for keeping your church doors open, and all of you need to be saying that because they're all around town, they're closed. This is the time people are coming and should be coming to the church, right? So you weren't there that day, but we are here today, and this is a day that matters. This is a day the Lord's made, so let's not be defeated. Let's share. Let's take a chance. And you might have just a couple of few chosen words. I'm not afraid because I know, I know God's in control. Or I'm not afraid because I trust God. He's good and he's great. Okay, just a few chosen words. Students, same thing. Be empowered. Let's close in prayer.